Underdog Fantasy is the fastest growing fantasy app and easiest place to play fantasy sports. Just jump on underdogfantasy.com or download the app, draft your team, and that's it. And if drafts aren't your thing, they also have a pick'em game where you can win 20 times your money in a single night. Use promo code RADIO and Underdog will double your first deposit when you sign up with up to $100 in bonus cash. Deposit $100? Get $100 free. That's promo code RADIO. Terms and conditions apply. Welcome to the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. Ask and you shall receive. Or so it was for me when I asked the NBA deities, whoever they may be, to get us some brand new series for the weekend. They got us halfway there. I get, maybe I should have opened with ask and you shall half receive. But we'll have something by the end of the weekend, won't we? I guess maybe we don't have to. Hmm. Celtics Bucks, where are we at with this one? Bucks game six coming up tonight. Presumably a game seven would be Monday, if I'm not mistaken. So maybe we don't. Maybe it's asking you might or might not receive. We're partway there, though, as the Miami Heat knock off the Philadelphia 76ers. Heat are on to the conference finals They've been this far recently. Remember, the Heat went to the finals in the bubble, and they were consistently underrated throughout this whole process. No one, people just don't really believe in Miami. They had a good, by all accounts, they had a really nice path. Getting the one seed ended up being really helpful because you had Hawks in the first round, which is an eminently beatable team. They're just not as good as some of the other upper echelon clubs. And then of the upper teams, Philly was easily the, I think I've called them a paper tiger on the podcast before, which maybe that's not totally fair, but they're a tick below. Coaching-wise, Doc Rivers just doesn't really have the adjustment mentality, and then they didn't have Joel Embiid for the first two games of that series. Uh, and James Harden isn't really, I mean, he's, he's always had issues in the playoffs. He's always needed somebody else to help carry him at this time of year, but he was particularly bad other than one big game, which was nice. Got him a key win there. My Twitter timeline was completely flooded yesterday after the Heat Sixers game ended with Sixers screwed it up, Sixers blew it, Sixers did. Six- Dude, the Heat were the favorites. That series went the way it was supposed to go. It took Miami six games to get there, which means Philly put up a pretty good fight, but they weren't as good. Should they have been better? Maybe. That's the only argument I would hear. But Miami was easily the better team this regular season and in the playoffs. Sixers tried to add James Harden with not that much time left in the regular season. It went fine, I guess. I mean, they got off to a pretty good start when he joined them. But, I mean, that's a weird bunch of pieces to try to fit together. In any event, that one's over. Miami advances, and they await. Boston-Milwaukee, which has been a, a wonderful series so far. Game six tonight in Milwaukee. Bucks favored by one and a half. Total of 212 and a half. That's actually up a little bit from the opening line. And I think we've talked enough about why. First of all, last game went over, so that's a good reason why. That total was at 211 and a half, which is pretty much where this one's at as well. Um, eh, little... Opened ever so... Sl- eh, I mean, it's really pretty much right on the mark. Boston was favored by five and a half points. Milwaukee beat them largely due to rebounding. That game was almost all about rebounds. Milwaukee got a ton of offensive rebounds. They were able to convert enough of those into points because overall they didn't shoot all that well. It was pretty much Giannis on offense and then everybody else where they could squeeze in a bucket here and there. Boston offensively has actually been pretty good lately. Al Horford did less in this one, but was more, again, the facilitator. And then Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, those guys played uh, decently. Marcus Smart was pretty good. Daniel Tice was actually excellent. He was a plus seven in his 11 minutes off the bench. A little surprised he didn't see a little bit more time. But again, some of that has to do with who you're playing against. And it's not all what you're bringing to the table. But still, uh, times he was on the floor, things went well for Boston. 
Drew Holiday, after having a brutal game, still didn't shoot the ball well, but was just terrific on defense again. But what I'm looking at, of course, is how does the game play out from a pace standpoint? And repeatedly, 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 we've seen up until this last ball game, the home team has pretty much dictated the speed of play. But in this one, thanks to the fact that Milwaukee had a truckload of extra chances on offense, they were able to sort of quote-unquote speed the game up a little bit. They ended up with about 115 chances at the rim, which is a very high number in a series that had been played about 10 possessions less than that per team. But again, how much of that was the reality of game speed and how much of that was Milwaukee getting those extra opportunities and that, you know, putbacks, that takes four or five seconds off the clock. That's a really short possession, if you want to call it that. Boston side, they were much closer to where the series has been most of the way through, which is around 100 possessions. So what does that mean then going into game six in Milwaukee? Typically, the home team has been able to, I don't want to say decide how the game gets played, but they do seem to steer it a little bit in terms of how fast the game is going to happen. And in the last one, Boston had about 105, 106 possessions. Milwaukee, again, superior rebounding and lower turnovers in that one. They were up around 114, 115. So that one was closer to 220 possessions. This last ball game was closer to whatever the crap I just said it was on Wednesday. Total finished at 217. What were we just talking about a minute ago? Milwaukee had like 116. Boston had about 100. So that was about 216 again. Can Milwaukee get the game going fast enough? That's that's the question that you ask yourself with this total. And so far, they've been able, at least in the last couple of ball games, Milwaukee's been able to steer the game tempo. Guys, we are so pumped to introduce some of our new friends, Vincero Collective. If you don't know Vincero yet, they're a premium lifestyle brand out of San Diego carrying watches, sunglasses, and more. Perfect for men or women of any style. Why does Dan, why do I love Vincero? They're modern. They're ethical. With the goal of crafting premium lifestyle accessories for those devoted to growth in any and all aspects of life. Health, wealth, community, whatever. Visit VinceroCollective.com slash hoopball to get a special 15% off and free shipping discount just for our listeners. Again, that's VinceroCollective.com slash hoopball. Vincero spelled V-I-N-C-E-R-O. Their products are stylish. They're of high quality. They're eye-catching. They're modern designs. The watches are stainless steel, durable silicon, and Italian marble straps. For the glasses, all lens are polarized. The frames are handcrafted. And because they know that online shopping can be frustrating, they have a five-year guarantee and a 365-day free return policy. That's nuts, but you don't even need to take my word for it. They have over 30,000 five-star reviews. They've been featured in Forbes, Business Insider, and Newsweek, just to name a few. Go to VinceroCollective.com slash hoopball. Get your 15% off and free shipping offer now. Hey, folks, Dan here. And a reminder, if you look for it, every day is a cause for celebration. You can celebrate a friend for their promotion. Their wedding, they had a baby, or some, you know, life thing. You can celebrate yourself for getting your back to finally crack. It's no easy feat, especially if you got an old back. Or maybe you just want to celebrate living in the year 2022 where you can get beer, wine, and spirits delivered from Drizzly in under 60 minutes without leaving your couch. Right now, Drizzly is giving all new customers $5 off their first order with code FAST5. So download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y dot com. And use the promo code FAST5 for 5 bucks off your first order. It's the number one app for alcohol delivery. 5 bucks off your first order. FAST5, the promo code F-A-S-T-5 at checkout. Go to drizzly.com or download the app today. Enjoy the convenience of beer, wine, and spirits straight to your door in under 60 minutes. 
They even steered the game tempo in that first game in Milwaukee, but the two teams shot so horribly that it didn't matter. That game got to 204 points, but it was like 225, 230 possessions. A lot of the missed, again, offensive rebounds, rebound and run out type of stuff. Missed shots do lead to more possessions kind of artificially, but even if you sort of take out 5% or whatever you want to call it, it was still a pretty quick ball game. So Milwaukee's been able to speed things up a little bit lately. Can Boston clean the glass here going into this game in Milwaukee on Friday? This is going to be a tough one because in Milwaukee, you got to figure the Bucks are going to have a better opportunity to hit a few shots, get running, get going. 212 and a half. I think we know why the total jumped up a little bit. It's because the pace has been above that marker lately. But it's not that much wiggle room. 212 and a half. What if it gets up to 213? If you really think there's going to be like 215, 216 possessions, that's barely any breathing room. So I would probably leave this one alone. There's a chance, you know, does Milwaukee play a little better defensively on Boston? Maybe. Does that sort of hold their number down? But the Bucs want to go. They want to go, go, go. They're not going to win a half-court battle with the Celtics without Chris Middleton. He's the guy that helps kind of trigger things when they got to take a late jump shot. That's the guy they'd want to go to. If Giannis can't get himself to the rim in the open court, things break down. We saw it against Phoenix. Giannis was able to get near the free throw line. He had a lot of success there. He's certainly having plenty of success against Boston. Did it early in the shot clock, kind of before things got settled. Can't get all the way to the rim because they're sagging everybody back. But he can get pretty close. I think this number is pretty close to right. There, I think there's a decent chance that it goes over by about a bucket. And, of course, you have that, like, what if Boston's about to get eliminated? There might be a lot, an extra foul or two at the very end. If Boston's winning this game, so you could look at maybe even a correlated parlay. If Boston's winning this game and it looks like it's headed to Game 7, it probably goes under. If Milwaukee's winning this game, it probably goes over. I would think. Or they certainly would. I can't imagine Milwaukee wins a game where their own team total doesn't clear the mark. They're going to have to get somewhere. You know, they had 110 in that last ball game, right? That cleaned their team total mark. And then Memphis Golden State is the other one here on Friday night. Warriors by eight and a half at home, total of 218 and a half. That is a strikingly big line considering the Warriors just got punked a couple days ago. That was Wednesday, lost by almost 40 points in Memphis. Warriors were a three-point favorite in that ballgame, so the line moved about as far as you'd expect. Total at 218.5 is basically where the last one was. Pace was decent, though. Warriors shot themselves in the foot, crap ton of turnovers. They had about 110 possessions in that ballgame. Memphis had far more than that because of the turnover difference and the rebounding difference. Grizzlies had 99 field goal attempts and only nine turnovers. That's pretty damn good. Sort of shot per turnover kind of thing. 11 to 1. And 30 free throws. I mean, this was just a round butt kicking in that ball game. It wasn't remotely close. But again, you know, you break it all down. Memphis, you're talking about 120 some odd possessions in the ball game. Warriors didn't have to get that many. And that game was going to go over. It had almost no chance of staying under. Warriors, I think, would prefer to not let Memphis get crazy, all the turnovers, the runouts, the rebounding. Warriors have certainly been better at home. And they're still up three games to two in this series, even after the Grizzlies won the last one. So the, the Dubs do have a little bit of breathing room here. I, I'm a little confused on kind of the desperation element. Do we see, what do we see out of the Warriors in this next ball game? Steph wasn't very good in the last one. Nobody was, really. Clay was... Okay. Otto Porter got hurt. No surprise there. Grizzlies did that coming in waves thing that uh, works out pretty well for them on occasion. So they racked up as many victories as they did this year. Don't know what that weird sound was in the background. Hopefully that didn't come through to you guys. Came through to me. Maybe you missed it. Uh, all right. As far as the, the numbers go on this ball game. I think it's probably more instructive to look back at the games in Golden State and see what they were trying to do, and it still moved at a pretty good clip. It wasn't quite the breakneck speed of the last ball game, but it was still pretty fast. And the ones that went under typically did so because of bad shooting. 
but there were a lot of field goal attempts in pretty much every game in this series. Like, the field goal attempts have been there. This is a series that has profiled more as an over series than an under one. Both teams have been getting over 110 possessions per ball game up until the last one, which I think the Warriors would have gotten there as well if they did any rebounding at all. They still got close. I think they had like 109. So it's weird to me that, you know, we, we, I focus so hard on unders, unders, unders in the playoffs. This series has been profiling pretty well as an over series. It hasn't gone there every single time. They've had some unders mixed in when the teams just didn't shoot the ball well. But pretty much every single ball game, there have been enough possessions to get to the over. I'm trying to think back to when this series started. I think it began way back on last Sunday, May 1st, right? Wasn't that the opening game? Warriors won 117 to 116. Total in that game was 223 and a half. And that was certainly the highest scoring game. A lot of shots. Teams made their shots. If you just want, you know, you could throw off free throws and turnovers just for a minute. I mean, not that that's a good way to look at things, but if you just assume that those tend to level off on a game-to-game basis, the number of field goal attempts alone in this series has told us it's profiled as an over series. There were 188 field goal attempts in game one, which went over. Game two went under, but there were still 186 field goal attempts in that one. Teams just missed a crap ton of shots. Then they had a then they had three days off between ball games, which is just patently absurd. And then they came back, and the number of field goal attempts was way down, but only because the Warriors didn't need to rebound at all. They hit 63% of their shots in a game that was, you know, we talk about missed shots create kind of an artificially high number of possessions. Made shots create an artificially low number of possessions. 176 possessions or shots in this one, but you know, if you shoot 63%, you don't need very many. Everybody's taking the ball out of the hoop. It was blowout city. It still ended up at 254. Then you get to Monday, game four. That one went under, only scored 199 points on 186 field goal attempts. That's crazy. Again, I'm just throwing out free throws and turnovers for now. Again, this isn't what you should do in a, in a true full handicap, but just as kind of a point of reference. And then the Warriors only had 80 field goal attempts last game because they rebounded so terribly and had so many turnovers. Grizzlies had 99, as we just talked about. So they've been around 180 or higher in pretty much every ball game. The only ones where they didn't hit it were this the hyper lopsided games, the super blowouts where one team was just so bad or so good that they didn't need or get follow the logic there, as many field goal attempts as they might have wanted. So if you think there's going to be another 185 field goal attempts in this ballgame and the turnovers are not too insane and the free throw numbers are relatively normal, it probably has a chance to go over again. Suppose we'll see. And as far as the rest of the weekend goes, we can't really profile any potential game sevens, but Mavs Suns other than that one, I guess I should say, is scheduled for Sunday. What I meant was Celtics, Bucks, Grizz, Warriors, if that goes any farther. Suns six-point home favorite for Sunday evening. Total of 207 and a half, which feels painfully low. Uh, but at the same time, it's been a really slow-paced series. In stark contrast to the the Warriors Grizzly series we were just talking about, Dallas beat Phoenix 113-86, and obviously this was a, a very lopsided game where Phoenix had 22 turnovers, just like we were talking about with the Warriors. Dallas only had six; they also had 36 free throws. The Warriors 21, but at the end of it all, the two teams had 78 and 77 field goal attempts. So this one you're talking about 155 field goal attempts compared to the 185 we were talking about in the other ballgame. I mean, if you want to have a comparison of game pace, look no further. 113 to 86 gets you around 200 points. In general, that's kind of where this series has been profiled. But again, you can, you can do a lot of this work by just looking at the number of field goal attempts. Phoenix's massive number of turnovers and really poor shooting led to a few extra offensive rebounds. It's that same thing where you kind of 
inflate the number a tiny bit on total number of possessions, but overall this series has been played pretty slowly. Like, just a shade between 200 and 210 possessions. And I think a few times I've mentioned I thought the number was pretty good for this one. That's why they haven't moved it all that much until there was a, one game where they went flying over the number. That was when Phoenix scored you know 300 points all by themselves, which, again, very much a mirage. And then it started going under. Then you had like one little over mixed in there, and it created this little over bubble. But again, for the most part, for the most part, this game, this series has been played in that kind of 205 to 215 possessions range, and the defense has won out, typically, typically. And it did in the last one again. And as we've talked about before, game sevens tend to be very slow, very slow. Not surprisingly, money is coming in on the over so far. At least tickets are coming in on the over. Uh, the under has actually had more of the cash because it opened at 209.5 and, and it's been falling. At 207.5, you're going to see a lot of slow bets coming in on an over just because that's such a, uh, such a low number. Once you see 2.0 something, you almost never see people bet the under unless it's like one of those excruciating, grinding type of series. And this one doesn't feel like that because there's been a few better, efficient offensive games mixed in but at game sevens i'm pretty much looking at an under unless something pulls me away from it and i you know i can't you know phoenix has been very good and efficiently offense side at home that was a weird phrasing on that sentence but you guys got through it with me so that's the thing that could blow it up and also late game fouling things of that nature but overall i you know this one ending around 200 wouldn't surprise me at all so slightly to the under for that sunday game as far as series prices go, I don't know that there's a whole lot left. I mean, we can... So, th- there's something there. You know, let's talk about it. We, 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 we still have a few more minutes here. I got seven or eight more minutes on the podcast that I before I'd like to wrap things up. Bucks are minus 240, up three games to two. That was one where we got in on Milwaukee early. I mentioned I thought they were going to win the series before it even started. And we had an opportunity to uh, middle that series if we wanted to. It's actually become an even better hedging opportunity here later in the series. The Bucks still up, but Boston not by any means completely eliminated. All they got to do is win two games in a row. So if you were riding our initial bet on Bucks at, I think it was like plus 180 or plus 200. I mean, they were they were slight underdogs. More than I expected, but not insane. And then it got to a point where the Celtics were like a minus 120 favorite. So you could have paired those up and had about a $45, $50 middle. With the Bucks going back up three games to two, now you could actually get both sides on an underdog price. So that's a colossal arbitrage opportunity here on the series price. You know, plus 175, plus 180 on one side, plus 200 on the other. Uh, it's very easy to decide which team you think is actually going to win. You make the larger bet there, but you can also hedge with the other side, and either way, you end up with a really nice profit. So that's pretty good. I like that a lot. Um, not going to bet the Bucks at minus 240 because we got in on them earlier. If I didn't bet Boston in an earlier opportunity, this would be a great time to do so because you're not going to get a better price on them now. And if you think the Bucks finish this thing off, if you feel really confident about it, you can just let the Bucks r- bet ride. So that's a pretty easy one. Phoenix-Dallas, well... Uh, was one that I don't think we ever really got in on. Phoenix was a pretty good sized favorite going into that series. Once the Mavericks tied it up, each step along the way, you you were able to get them or get the Suns at a slightly better price if you wanted to. I think we've mostly left them alone to this point. And I don't see any reason to change that up now. If you bet Dallas at plus 210 and... I mean, that's... Not an not a horrible wager, but at the same time, you could just run that up against a money line bet. Like that, that's a little bit, it's a little bit silly. With uh, when the hell do these teams play? That's the Sunday game, right? Yeah, Dallas uh, plus six on the spread. What is the money line for that individual game right now? Where are we at with this one? Yeah, I mean, you could find Mavericks at, as juicy as, like, plus 225 at a lot of places, which is better than plus 210 on the series price. They should line up relatively close, but this is why it's good to have a number of different sports books because, I mean, there's actually a not insane chance 
that this thing could get bet down a little bit. I think the Suns are minus 245 for the individual game. Minus 260 on the series price. It's close. Probably not going to be able to find more than about $5 in there if you wanted to try to set up a game money line and a series price middle at different sports books. But, I mean, you know what? If you can find it, you can try it. Overall, eh, I don't know. I do think the Suns win this ball game. I think the price on them is too high, which means to that end, the value play would be Dallas. But, you know, this is a game seven, so there's no point in going the value play if you don't think it's actually going to happen. So I'll leave that one alone. And then the Warriors are minus 1,100 favored Grizzlies at plus 700. Uh, that was one where we we took a chance on Memphis early, and they made it where they, you know, Warriors, after they won the first one, that became kind of a clunky thing. You could get it on Memphis at a really high price, then they lost a few games in a row. So this one, and, and lost jaw in the process. So that one didn't end up being a pretty interesting, that one didn't end up being a good series to bet into, and I would continue to leave it alone. Because there's not a whole lot you're going to do. If the Grizzlies win this game, go back to Memphis, they're still going to be a big underdog on the the series price it's going to drop pretty precipitously it just doesn't feel like a risk worth taking say oh memphis maybe they sneak one out in golden state and then i come back and i bet the warriors at like minus 300 on the individual game or the the series price for game seven or whatever that might end up being and it does set you up to have a little bit of a middle there but the probability like the reason that that you could set yourself up for that size middle is that it's not likely memphis wins this game in golden state they could anything's possible but it's just not likely. That's going to be hostile. Warriors are going to come back. They're going to be ready to go. Uh, I'd rather look at in-game stuff for that one. I think you can get a good feel for how the two teams are playing pretty quickly, actually. Doesn't tend to change that much mid-game, surprisingly. Sometimes it does, but more often than not, no. All right. Okay, uh, let's roll you folks on into the weekend at this point. I think that's about that time. This is our Friday playoff. Did I even actually welcome anyone to the show? Sheesh, get it together, Dan. This was Fantasy NBA Today. Hope you guys enjoyed another week. Off-season show number 25 in the books. That's five weeks of off-season podcasts complete. And only a million left to go before we actually get to another fantasy basketball season. But don't worry. Remember, we're counting it down to, like, end of August, early September, when we can start doing a bunch of mock draft stuff. So it's not nearly as far as it seems. If you're if you're aiming for mid-October, that's five months away. If you're aiming for early September, that's only three and a half. And we've already done over one. We can do it. We can do it, friends. We'll try to get a few more lessons going next week. I might start looking at uh, some of the how did they do stuff. But Yahoo screwed with us this year, and they changed their pre-ranks. So we might have to roll off of ADPs this season for the first time, and I'm not thrilled about it. It's going to muck up our results because that's not how Yahoo ranks their players in the draft room. It, it by default, sorts by X rank or pre-rank, whatever the crap they want to call it on a year-to-year basis. But they changed it midstream, and I've got a pretty good rant on that queued up for Monday's show. I'm Dan Bespris, by the way. Hi and by at Dan Vespers on Twitter, sportsethos.com. Hey, go check out the Fantasy Pass in the offseason. There's no such thing as an offseason, only pre-draft season. NBA draft coverage in full swing over at sportsethos.com. We also have Fantasy MLB today, Fantasy NFL today. For those of you that are getting set, football schedules got released, I think, yesterday, if I'm not mistaken. JP Sticko, that show is rolling, man. He's already got some sleepers floating around out there. So go check out Fantasy NFL today, this weekend. Get your football fix as well. Enjoy it. Enjoy the weekend. Back with you on Monday here on Fantasy NBA Today. I, once again, am Dan Vespers, and I'll talk to you in a couple of days. So long, everybody. Underdog Fantasy is the fastest growing fantasy app and easiest place to play fantasy sports. Just jump on underdogfantasy.com or download the app, draft your team, and that's it. And if drafts aren't your thing, they also have a pick'em game where you can win 20 times your money in a single night. 
Use promo code RADIO and Underdog will double your first deposit when you sign up with up to $100 in bonus cash. Deposit $100? Get $100 free. That's promo code RADIO. Terms and conditions apply.